So I'm going to start things off here, going over uh, first-time patella dislocations. And this is an evolving and somewhat controversial topic, so I'll lay out some of the evidence. Uh, luckily, I have good friends in the patellofemoral study group, all of whom are in this room, and so uh, they can help guide me through this challenge. So here's a case, 26-year-old male soccer athlete and a 14-year-old female volleyball athlete. They both had first-time patella dislocations without loose bodies or osteochondral fractures. The guy had a contact injury with no prior events. He has normal bony alignment, specifically normal patella height, no dysplasia, normal TTTG, no patella tilt. The young girl had a non-contact event and a prior dislocation on her opposite side. She has patella alta, trochlear dysplasia, a lateralized force vector, and patella tilt. So I ask, is the natural history of each condition the same, and should our treatment plan be the same? We know that the incidence of patella dislocations highest in young females, that's been shown, and also that sports-related is about 60 to 70 percent. We need a high index of suspicion because the majority will spontaneously reduce. If we see this in the field, I would say we don't have to wait to get an x-ray like this. We can bring them into extension, reduce it, and then move along. There's really no consensus on early mobilization and weight bearing. I think it's impractical to immobilize inflection. It might lead to issues with atrophy, stiffness. Um, and so really most of us are doing early brace protection. Range is tolerated, weight bearing is tolerated, aspiration as needed, similar to pre-rehabilitation for other knee conditions. We should get standard knee x-rays and typically for me a mechanical axis view. And I would advocate an advanced imaging study to help make decisions. One, to rule out osteochondral fractures, loose body but also, as we'll see, to look at the relevant anatomy for risk stratification. We want to carefully evaluate and measure risk factors for occurrence, essentially looking at normal versus abnormal bony architecture. And so we need a small biomechanics refresher. We've written uh, on this. Uh, Jack will go over this. I will not dwell on it. But we really need to understand why patella alta is a problem. It takes the kneecap longer to stabilize in the groove, so it's vulnerable to dislocation. We measure it using the Catan de Champs ratio. We can also use patella trochlear index. Trochlear dysplasia, we'll talk more about this, how we can go from normal to shallow to flat to convex and the implications of this. A lateralized force vector, estimated by the Q angle, quantified by the TTTG or the TTPCL. And we have to recognize that there are a ton of other factors at play that we always think about, like valgus, like femoral antiversion, like hyperlaxity using Baton criterion, like neuromuscular status, personal history of contralateral dislocation, family history of patella instability. We need to recognize that the MPFL is the primary restraint to lateral translation from 0 to 30, and that it's torn in 99% of these dislocation events. The location of this tear can be variable. And we've also learned that there can be a range of chondral disease with patella dislocations as well. And so I want to just borrow a concept from the shoulder as we delve into this a little deeper. And I know this is quite an oversimplification in the shoulder these days, but it's useful nonetheless for learning, particularly at a young level. So we were able to separate tubs versus ambry in the shoulder, and we know that there's a huge continuum versus traumatic uh, and atraumatic, unilateral versus multidirectional. And so bringing this to patella dislocation, we can recognize maybe high energy dislocations and contact injury, or low energy and non-contact. The one on top has normal anatomy, the one below has abnormal anatomy. The one up top is at risk of hemorthrosis and osteochondral injury, where the one on bottom may have less swelling. The one on top has a lower risk of recurrent instability because of the normal anatomy, but a higher risk of acute fractures, possibly requiring fixation or loose body removal. And on the contrary, the one on the bottom has a lower risk of acute osteochondral injuries requiring imminent surgery. We've been treating the majority of first-time dislocations non-operatively, but the range of recurrence is 17 to 71%. Bob Magnuson looked at this, and when he followed um, uh, first-time dislocators non-operatively for three years, only 26% returned to activity without limitations, and 86% cited their patella dislocation. Similarly, Beth Schubenstein and team looked at a quality-adjusted life year analysis, and they showed that non-operative treatment was the least costly, but also least effective when compared to immediate and delayed surgery. So we look at several studies for risk factors. You can see them here. In this particular study, looking at these risk factors, if you had four or more points, your odds ratio was 4.88 compared with less than three points. 
In this more recent study, looking at patella alta, dysplasia, skeletal immaturity, and contralateral dislocation, the presence of all four variables had a predicted risk of recurrence of 88%. The presence of two or three had 55 and 75% respectively. Diane Dom and the Mayo Group looked at dysplasia, immature physis, young age, patella alta, sports-related injuries, and they came up with this algorithm that for the ones that had two or three of these major risk factors, they recommend surgery because it's a 60 to 70 percent recurrence rate. And so we go back to our vignette and our guy who had none of these underlying risk factors. I would advocate perhaps non-operative treatment, core to floor protocol, quad core, posterior chain, sleeve and or brace, functional progression, uh, working on neuromuscular, everything that we're doing similar for the ACL, and then testing them before return to sport. And they may return quite readily. This is the Isikos guidelines for patella instability, which can be useful as well. But for our girl, perhaps we might be considering a shift into operative treatments. And so I would say that there's more questions than answered with this selection. Non-op would be a faster return, no surgical risk, but there might be a risk of instability, um, uh, particularly for the chondral ligaments if they dislocate again. But if you do operation early, you may have reduced recurrence, but you may introduce more, obviously, surgical morbidity, including stiffness, a longer time to return, and we really don't know in big series the functional outcomes and return to sport. So I would just close on a couple of other thoughts. Um, there's, uh, is there any role for MPFL repair for first-time dislocation? You may consider an acute repair in patients with an osteochondral fracture or loose body if they have normal underlying anatomy, good tissue quality, and a distinct zone of injury. That's fairly rare in my hands. I would say there's no role for MPFL repair in the risk stratification paradigm for those patients without loose bodies or fractures, and we're talking about acute. These patients have underlying anatomy problems and I'd say a high risk of failure with repair. Acute repair does not reduce the recurrence rate. We've seen that in multiple series. MPFL reconstruction, as Adam's gonna go over, does reduce recurrence rates, um, as been shown uh, in this uh, study. There's no role currently for bony surgery for the first time patella dislocation. However, I do worry in cases of extreme alta or lateralized force vector about MPFL isometry, and we can discuss that. And I do consider guided growth uh, in high-risk skeletally immature patients with valgus. And so we know that these are the clear surgical indications when you have loose bodies or fractures. Uh, these are just some cases where you can use screws uh, to fixate the fragment. Um, you can also use uh, suture anchors or sutures uh, for cartilage only and skeletally immature. Uh, consensus statement from the IPSG, if you're going to fix a fragment, you should uh, stabilize and address patella instability. And just to hit this home again, there's no role for isolated lateral release for patella instability. So overall, I'm hoping that this uh, makes some sense for you and look forward to discussing it. I'd say the management of the first-time dislocator is evolving. We're still treating the vast majority without osteochondral fracture or loose body non-operatively. However, we definitely want to risk stratify discussing with the patient and family, and we're enrolling in prospective studies like Jupiter and Pappy to try to learn more about this. If you're fixing or removing the fragment, I think you should add a soft tissue stabilization. An isolated MPFL reconstruction is the gold standard surgical treatment if you go down that pathway. And I thank you very much for your attention. We'll now bring up Adam Yankee to go through the MPFL anatomy reconstruction and why it matters.